Hello. Hello. <laughs> Don't be scared, it's only us. <laughs> I would be very scared. I mean, seriously, when you said you were going to go out for face masks, <laughs> I didn't expect this. Welcome to another episode of We Need to Talk About Dot Dot Dot. I am the Big Daddy D, David Mabley, and my hobbies include walking in the jungle, horse riding, and of course, slamming evil. And I am Luke Murphy, and I have the power of ten tigers. Or at least several large cats. <laughs> can I take this off? You re- certainly can. Re- well, you know, that's that's the maximum budget spent for this episode. <laughs> I'm sorry, we have a budget. Oh yeah. Two quid they cost. <laughs> We are back in the 90s to look at another example of the superhero genre for the first time since Batman Mask of the Phantasm, way back in season one. (laughs) So we're definitely going with the season thing now, are we? Well, I think we we are, yes. Well, we need to to differentiate, don't we? Otherwise you're just going 2019 episodes, 2020 episodes. Okay then. Well, (laughs) season one it is then. So we're on that difficult third season now. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> to be honest with you, season one and season two was difficult. <laughs> well, when you sat in the same room as me and I'm wearing something like that. <laughs> oh, yeah, that. So, whilst these days the superhero genre usually does very well for itself, thanks to the Marvel Cinematic Universe, back in the 90s it was a little bit patchy. Yeah, and I mean, for every good comic book movie adaptation, you, you're usually guaranteed a really, really, really bad one. <laughs> so, for every crow, there was a crow sequel. For every mask, there was Judge Dredd. And for every blade, there was Spawn. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, the superhero genre was temporarily killed off for about a year or so, thanks to the disastrous Batman and Robin, with its rubber bat nipples, appalling ice-based puns, and numerous close-ups of Batman's arse and codpiece whilst he was suiting up. God damn it, Schumacher. But during this time, there was another costume crime fighter that came to our cinemas, but this one didn't get quite the same amount of fanfare or attention that anything from the House of Marvel, DC, or 2008 got. Today, we will be talking about that film. Today, we will be talking about The Phantom. The Phantom. (laughs) However, I feel that once again, we're getting a little ahead of ourselves. So in order to learn a little bit more about this purple-clad protector of the people, we need to go back to the very beginning. The Phantom was created by Lee Falk in 1936, two years before Superman, and was a daily newspaper comic strip that is still running today. Falk had conceived the Phantom as a sort of hybrid of Zorro and Tarzan, a masked white Avenger who lived in the jungles of Africa who fought a generations long battle against the same pirate clan who had killed some of his ancestors. The Phantom himself doesn't actually have any superpowers and has to rely on his strength, agility and fearsome reputation. So, like Batman really. However, unlike Batman, he also uses guns. And instead of fighting crime in a fictional city, the Phantom operates from the fictional African country of Bangala. There have been various Phantoms throughout history, with the mantle being passed from father to son. As a result of this, the Phantom is feared as some sort of immortal being who cannot be killed and has earned himself the nickname as uh, such as the man who cannot die the guardian of the eastern dark and most well known the ghost who walks the ghost who walks phantom defenders of the earth yes <laughs> yes in, as, as we've just outlined there <laughs> very for, poorly for, for many children ourselves included growing up in the 80s our first exposure of the Phantom came from the Defenders of the Earth cartoon, where the Phantom teamed up with fellow adventurers owned by the King Features Syndicate, such as Flash Gordon, Mandrake the Magician, and Lothar. Prince Valiant would also appear in one of the episodes, after Ming the Merciless sent the Defenders back in time to Arthurian England. I'm not sure that Popeye didn't turn up in that one. He was probably helping out Bruce Lee fighting mummies in the underworld. This particular version of the Phantom was able to use supernatural means to give himself increased strength and speed by saying the incantation by jungle law, the ghost who walks calls forth the power of ten tigers. But 
It is only in this cartoon series that the Phantom has such an ability. Luckily for him, he never had to fight off the Eleven Tigers. There was also the Phantom 2040 cartoon that began airing in 1994, which was set in a steampunk-based future and had the latest incarnation of the Phantom battling against pollution and evil corporations. Although the series lasted two seasons and had a number of merchandise tie-ins, including a video game for the Super Nintendo and Sega Mega Drive, it is considerably less well-remembered than the likes of Batman the Animated Series, which was around at the same time. Although it did have a superb voice acting cast, including Mark Hamill, always good, the Joker himself, mm -hmm. Ron Perlman, even better, and Margot Kidder. Wow, mm -hmm. that's Lewis Lane. So, in the summer of 1996, Phantom came to cinemas, produced and released by Paramount Pictures. The movie was set in the 1930s and incorporated elements from several of the Phantom's earliest comic strips, comic strip adventures. Now, Joe Dante, director of such films as Gremlins. Um, had been originally planned to direct the film and had been in talks with it since the early 90s. With Bruce Campbell, of all people, yes, him with the chin, set to be the title character. Now, <laughs> I, I surely can't be the only one that would want to see Bruce Campbell playing the Phantom. I think I'm going to have to go onto Photoshop and just superimpose one of these on Bruce Campbell's face. I mean, let us be honest with you. Let us be honest with one another. You know, the greatest chin in the universe must be made into the Phantom. <laughs> Groove air. Now, unfortunately, Dante eventually dropped out of directing duties due to um, conflicting schedules. Yet he remained attached to the film as an executive producer. Joel Schumacher was also considered at one point to direct the film. <laughs> but the job was given to Simon Winsome instead. Yeah, dodged a bullet there. So, um, um, <laughs> Winsor had been a fan of the character since childhood and his enthusiasm for the source material got him the, direct, uh, the directing role. His more recent work at the time included The Young and the Young Jones Chronicles and Lonesome Dove, so he'd already had experience of making numerous period pieces. Adding to that connection to Indiana Jones, the film was also written by Jeffrey Boa, whose numerous screenplays had included Indiana Jones and The Last Crusade. Billy Zane! God bless you, Billy Zane! Already a huge fan of the comic strip, ended up getting the part at a after actively lobbying for it for years. After his casting, he went through an extensive exercise programme for a year and a half to get the superhero physique required for the role, as Zane refused to wear a costume with moulded rubber muscles like the ones on the Batman films. Now that's something that's actually more common mm. now, isn't it? You see guys like uh, Chris Hemsworth and Chris, uh, Chris Pratt and what have you, get themselves into like absolutely fantastic physical shape because they're going to be playing a, a Marvel superhero and what have you. Yeah. But in the 90s, I mean, I'm not saying that Michael Keaton didn't have a fantastic physique for Batman, but his figure was mostly made up with like the big sort of rubber muscles. Yeah. Billy Zane's actually doing this before it was cool to sort of yeah. actually get in fantastic physical shape. And when you see him, you know, without the Phantom outfit, you know, there's a couple of bits where he's like, well, you know, I'm making sure there's at least one scene where I've got my top off, you know. And, and he, um, he's, the lad's pretty cool. And, and I think it, um, I think. This helps with the fact that he was set in the 1930s because that type of body armor would probably not exist, etc. etc. So I think that actually genuinely does help with you know um, the, the historical setting. Oh, definitely. As well, so he's really, really quite good. It wouldn't make any sense if it was, if it was like you know that that time of period, and he, and he, and he basically steps out wearing what's essentially a, a, a tactical yeah yeah body Tats, suit. yeah tack armor attack armor. Um, speaking of the costume, <laughs> thankfully this film version of the costume decided to um, do away with the stripy blue and black underpants from the comics, uh, which is probably just as well. It's a shame, actually, for me. Um, <laughs> Zane also closed his other... <laughs> <laughs> no, just, just, no. Uh, Zane also cl uh, closely studied panels of the comic to capture the character's body language. There is a, a massive amount of charm uh, in Zane's performance as he plays the Phantom as a proper comic book hero, even down to the sort of, you know, hands on hips, checks out kind of uh, uh, poses that folk had drawn into the comic strips. Um, he's pure wholesomeness. He's an adventurer who seems to be in love with death defying danger and who never gives off a sense of being broody or tortured. A stark contrast from other comic book movies during the 1990s, such as Michael Keaton as Batman, or Brandon, more, probably more so Brandon Lee as The Grove. Alright, tell them nobody... Ladies, kindly pardon my error. 
Although the film was not a theatrical success, and we'll come on to that later, it was Zane's superb performance in this movie that led to him being cast in Titanic. Zane has had quite the varied career <laughs> since. <laughs> That's been very, very kind. He's appeared in everything from multiple award-winning blockbusters directed by James Cameron to complete and utter crap directed by Uwe Ball. But nothing, <laughs> nothing compares to his cameo appearance in Zoolander. Oh yes, yes. And his little cameo appearance in, in the um, Amazon series The Boys where he's literally playing himself. <laughs> He was also rather good in uh, Tales from the Crypt's Demon Knight as well. Yes, it was. Oh. Yes. Why wait? And, and let us not forget how different things could have been if he had got the part of Johnny in Dirty Dancing. Because it was just down to It was. <laughs> I, 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 I should you not. It was down to him and Swayze. Wow. And to be honest with you, I've seen footage of his audition. He was very, very good. He was, however, no Swayze. <laughs> but then again, not many people <laughs> not are. Many people are. <laughs> uh, filming began on October 3rd, 1995, and it concluded in uh, February uh, of 1996, with the cast and crew going to, from Los Angeles to Thailand, uh, then on to Australia, before heading back to Los Angeles to complete the scene that would ultimately end up deleted from the final cut of the movie, where the Phantom wrestles a lion. Now, whenever this fight scene ends up looking as bad as when Bruce Lee fought a lion in Game of Death 2, remains to be seen. Unlike a lot of other films we've covered here before on the show, uh, it was a rather relaxed um, production, to say. Um, it was short. Um, with little to no studio interference until we got to the editing process. But more on that later. So, with such a relaxed production, does that lead to a better film than what we're used to covering? Well, let's find out, shall we? As we now go on to the plot. So, we start off the movie with a recap for those that came in late. Um, this was actually how Lee started each issue following the first comic strip. Falk, who was in his 60s at the time, uh, is even narrating this as well, which is a nice touch. It all began a very long time ago. A small boy watched helplessly as his father was killed by the pirate leader, Kabai Seng. He jumped overboard and was washed ashore on a mysterious jungle island called Bengala. In the early 16th century, a young boy helplessly witnesses his father's death at the hands of Kabai Seng, the ruthless leader of the Seng Brotherhood who attacked their ship. The boy jumps overboard and is washed ashore on an island called Bengala, where he is found by local tribesmen, who take him to their village. There he is given the Skull Ring and is sworn to devote his life to the destruction of piracy, greed, cruelty and justice. Although, if they've got this ring of power, why have they waited for a washed up white kid to turn up? It's like if you were doing Black Panther, it's like, right, we've got all, we've got this incredible suit, we've got all this vibranium, shall we use it? No, let's wait, wait for a white guy to turn up first. <laughs> yes, the great white hope, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> uh, when the boy reaches adulthood, he adopts the identity of the Phantom, a masked Avenger. Over the next 400 years, the role of the Phantom is passed on from father to son, leading people to mistakenly believe that the Phantom is in fact a single, immortal figure. In 1938, Kit Walker, the 21st Phantom, finds a man named Quill, leading a mercenary group in the jungle. Quill is played by, oh look who it is, it's only bloody James Remar everyone, who we've seen in a previous episode of the show where he was Ajax, a member of the Warriors. Come out and play! <laughs> On a lesser note, he also replaced Christopher Lambert as Lord Raiden in that bloody awful second Mortal Kombat film, but, you know, let's gloss over that. Ah, uh, Christopher. <laughs> Lambert. <laughs> Quill's group of mercenaries are searching for one of the skulls of Tuganda, which grants its owner a tremendously destructive power. Oh look! A guy in a fedora hat searching for a treasure that's in the shape of a golden head in a booby-trapped underground cavern? That seems familiar. I don't know where they've got that from, man. <laughs> yes. At this point, you can tell that the writer of Indiana Jones also wrote this film as well. There are a number of scenes and action sequences throughout The Phantom that are almost identical to what we see in previous Indiana Jones films. But of course, years later, the idea of going on a search for mythical skulls in The Phantom was later used again for Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. Indiana Jones and the what? I don't... 
What's that? Oh, moving on. <laughs> are, we, are we choosing to ignore that one? Ignore what? Never mind. The Phantom saves the native boy that they've kidnapped to use as their guide, at one point getting the poor little bugger to drive the truck across <laughs> the very rickety looking road bridge. That's, that's actually really, really funny. Go on, you're right, keep going, right, keep, keep going, going, keep going. <laughs> Kid's shitting himself. <laughs> so, um, the Phantom saves the native boy and captures Quill's men, leading to be picked up by his allies in the Jungle Patrol. Essentially, the Phantom's got his own little private army almost. Oh, yes. He then discovers that Quill is not only a member of the same Brotherhood, but he's also the man that years ago, figuratively and literally, stabbed his father in the back. Kit's father, the 20th Phantom, is still knocking about though, frequently appearing as a ghost to give Kit some advice. A bit like a book, Kenobi really, only far more disapproving. Don't worry, I'll catch him. I have to. There's a woman involved. Saints be praised. It's about time. When are you going to go out and get a girl? <laughs> <laughs> Upon encountering the Phantom, Quill believes that the man is the same one he thought he had killed previously. However, Quill is able to flee with the skull and return to the United States of America, where he seeks, where he seeks his uh, award uh, from the leader of the Brotherhood, the impressively named Xander Drax. What a name. Yeah, I mean, that's a Xander Drax. X-A-N-D-E-R-D-R-A-X. Xander Drax. Drax is played by Treat Williams, who is clearly having a lot of fun playing a bad guy that's as over the top as his name. There's one scene where he stabs a guy in the eyes with a spiky killer microscope. I'd like your professional opinion on something under this microscope. <laughs> well, I guess you won't be needing knees anymore. And another where he impales a mobster on a spear and then complains about tweaking a muscle. In New York City, Kit's old college friend, Diana Palmer, is sent by her uncle David, the owner of a famous newspaper, to investigate Drax's involvement with a mysterious spider web symbol, which can be traced to the Mangala jungle. Diana is played by Kirsty Swanson, who, between the chase and the original Buffy the Vampire Slayer, had plenty of experience appearing in enjoyable 90s cheese. So, whilst on her way to Bengala, her airplane is hijacked by Drax's female air pirates led by Fen Patel Sala, played by Catherine Zeta-Jones. Ah yes, Catherine Zeta Spartacus. Hello. <laughs> Diana uh, is abducted and taken to their base on the waterfront in Bengala, but the Phantom is already on his way to rescue her, having, informed, uh, having been informed of the abduction by the Jungle Patrol's Captain Philip Horton, who essentially acts like a Commissioner Gordon figure. And just how successful is the Phantom's rescue mission? Well, it goes okay until they get outside of the boat, then they get grabbed by a load of henchmen. This is what happens when your choice of camouflage is purple. Oh, stop it. Purple is the perfect colour for stealth. And how do you work that out? Have you ever seen anybody sneaking around in purple? No. There you go then. <laughs> Diana shows that she's no damsel in distress when she elbows a henchman in the balls, and then the Phantom's pet wolf, Devil, shows up to aid their escape on a plane. Devil then gets back onto dry land to meet up with the Phantom's pet horse, Hero, and apparently these two can perfectly understand what each other are saying. Whoa, a wolf and a horse. Yes. Hmm. I have a feeling I know where Hideo Kojima got his ideas from. <laughs> Both the horse and the wolf somehow managed to catch up to the plane that the Phantom and Diana escaped in, which is currently leaking gasoline and in danger of exploding. Phantom drops down from his plane to his horse and possibly ruins the chance of there being a 22nd Phantom. Um, the Phantom takes Diana to the safety of his <coughs> secret headquarters, the Skull Cave. Yes, it's a big bloody skull carved <laughs> into the side of a mountain. Inconspicuous. It is not. <laughs> Mate, state your secret hideaway. <laughs> um, the Phantom then asks Captain Horton to ensure that Diana safely returns back to New York whilst he takes on the Brotherhood himself. However, he is also heading to New York as well under his mild-mannered alter ego, Kit Walker. Yes, folks, just like Judge Dredd took his helmet off in the 1994 Stallone film, the Phantom takes his mask off in this film despite the fact that in the original source material, neither character ever showed their face. Did you have to mention the Stallone Dread film? I am the law! In actual fact, sorry, in the, in the, in the comics, 
Vulcan and sort of previous people that obviously you know subsequent people have drawn me up. Whenever Kit Walker is being Kit Walker, not being the Phantom, his, his face is always shadowed. He's obscured in shadow. Yes. He's obscured in shadow, and it's really really nice little uh, little way of doing it. Kit meets up with David and Diana Palmer, and in the typical to uh, comic book trope, Diana has no idea that the purple-clad masked man she met in Bangalore a few days ago is the same person as her old friend who several years suddenly disappeared and has only now just returned. Yeah. Funny that. It's a bit strange. Um, however, <laughs> moving on. Billy Zane is such a distinctive-looking person that anyone is going to be able to tell that Kit Walker is actually the Phantom. Uh, especially when Kit doesn't bother disguising his voice and keeps doing the comic book Phantom poses out of sheer habit. I mean, Hang on, uh, you're the Phantom when you dress dressed out, day, aren't you? <laughs> Shit. Oh yeah, I've seen something like that before. You have? Yes, but I don't think it was silver, I think it was green. Green. Jade, perhaps. I mean, well, where did you see it? <laughs> At least with, and just really, really going, very, very, very quickly going, uh, going back to um, Batman the Animated Series and Batman Mask of the Phantasm, Kevin Conway did a wonderful, wonderful thing about his voice, where where he, where he was Batman, he was, oh, damn that guy. And, you know, he always sort of elevated his voice somewhat when he was playing as Bruce Wayne, so, you know, here, none of that. Yeah. You know, same voice. Same voice, <laughs> same mannerisms, same everything. Keeps doing that. Keeps doing that. <laughs> He also has no social skills whatsoever. So when the second skull is tracked down to the Museum of World History, he just walks right over, smashes the glass in the display case, and then that's it. What a hero. Drax and his men, however, are already there. And he unites the second skull with the first skull to reveal the location of the third skull on an uncharted island known as the Devil's Vortex. And it's just as well there was a map there, really. Hey, hang on a minute. Haven't I seen this scene before? Kit manages to escape from Drax and his henchmen where he slips back into his purple onesie, narrowly avoiding being crushed by a lift. The Phantom then manages to successfully escape from the police outside the museum. Drax keeps Diana with him, calling her his insurance policy against the Phantom. Salah flies them all to the Devil's Vortex, unaware that the Phantom has managed to hitch a ride on one of the plane's landing wheels. It's also during this time we get this one amazing piece of character development for Sala. Forget him, he's not coming. He's probably dead by now. What is wrong with you? Why are you so mean? Don't you care about anything? Like what? You figure it out. All right, all right, everybody just shut up. Right. Believe it or not, that one little moment there does have repercussions for what happens later on in the film. On the island, Drax meets with the pirate Kabai Sen, the direct descendant of the Brotherhood's original leader, who possesses the Third Skull, and, oh my word, look who it is, it's only bloody Shan Tsung from the first Mortal Kombat movie. Wow, what a strange crossover this has been so far. The Phantom teams up with Buffy the Vampire Slayer in order to take on Shang Tsung and Raiden tonight on pay-per-view. Anyway, Sen then casually disposes of one of Drax's business associates, who didn't realise that it was a bad idea to bring a gun to a cannon fight. Fatality. Drax finally gets hold of the third skull, only for Sen to then warn him about the existence of the fourth skull, which controls the power of the other three. Could have mentioned this sooner. Hmm, I wonder where that could be. Hmm. The Phantom then appears and battles against both men, whilst Diana and Sala team up to defeat the other villains, with Sala now apparently one of the good guys. Oh, okay. See, I told you that was an important piece of character development. Drax unites the three skulls, turns their power against the Phantom. By some very dodgy looking 90 CGI. Some very, very dodgy 90 <laughs> looking CGI. In the process, Quill is accidentally hit and disintegrated. The Phantom then uses the fourth skull his own ring to turn the skull's power back against them, destroying them and Drax in the powerful explosion. As the island is destroyed, the Phantom narrowly escapes with Diana and Sal. In Bengala once again, Diana reveals to the Phantom that she's figured out his secret and his double identity. To be fair, he is bloody dreadful at the whole secret identity shtick. Kit removes his mask, telling her that he is only allowed to reveal all the secrets to the one person the woman that he intends to marry. But then she leaves again for New York. 
Kit's father laments his son's failure to pursue Diana, but states that she will return to the Phantom's jungle one day. Uh, no she won't mate. Number one, they never made a sequel to this. And number two, she saw Titanic afterwards and that right put her off Billy Zane. Hmm. I'm your fiance. My fiance! Yes you are and my friend! My wife in practice if not yet by law so you will honour me. So, <laughs> indeed, we've reached that point of the show where we go. What have we watched what here? What have we watched here? Goodness me. Can we just say right out of the gate, despite the silliness, despite some dodgy CGI, despite some rather dodgy acting as well, <laughs> um, my God, this is fun. It's a lot of fun, it, isn't it's it? A, it's, it's, it's an incredibly, incredibly fun film. I think one, one of the first things to actually mention about it was the really, really good idea to do this as a period piece. To do this, to set this in the 1930s, I think it is. Um, I mean, obviously, so with the Defenders of the Earth cartoon and with Phantom 2040, um, they took a more future, well, definitely with Phantom 2040, they took a more futuristic version of it. I can I think, think Defenders we can of safely the say that they did that with Defenders as well. Defenders of the Earth was set in the year uh, 2015. <laughs> Wow. Oh, do you, do you remember 2015? <laughs> I mean, these days we've only got coronavirus to worry about, but five years ago we had fucking Ming the Merciless to worry about. Absolutely. Good job the Defenders were here. <laughs> Hail Ming. <laughs> um, so yeah, so it, it, it really, really sort of it lends itself really, really well. And, 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 and for that, you get the, um, it, it's an old, it's very much like Indiana Jones, you, you get a more, it's, a, it's an old school, um, adventure story, yeah. very, very much um, taking his cue from sort of the comics and what have you. But and and, and in many respects, making his, taking his cue from sort of the old Republic serials, the cliffhanger serials, mm -hmm. of which Flash Gordon was was, was part of that. I mean, it was uh, Flash Gordon, Flash Gordon, Street to Mars, Flash Gordon, Comics of Com the Universe. I, I even think there was a Phantom one as well. So these are the ones that were back in the 1930s, 1940s. They, they were a, they were a couple of Phantom ones. Um, First one went down very well. The second one, funnily enough, uh, they actually the, the rights to the character actually ran out whilst they were still filming, so they had to uh, oh, wow. they had to refilm it and change some of the bits around, and eventually they uh, retitled it as the Adventures of Captain Africa. Ah, oh. <laughs> well, that makes a lot of sense. Um, but, but again, because <laughs> it was the 1950s, you know. <laughs> um, but, but those those old Republic serials, uh, especially the comic book but Republic serials. Um, or I think it wasn't just Republic, it was other, other studios that did it as well. They're really kind of like the blueprint. There was a couple of Batman ones back in the day. Um, fast forward to this to sort of this film, set, um, set in the period. Um, but also have a look at things like, um, I mean, the main film of The Shadow, roughly around about the same time with Alec uh, Yes, 19, 1994. Um, go back a couple of years to, the, uh, to Disney's the Rocketeer, the Rocketeer which yes. I love the Rocketeer, absolutely superb, love that, love that. Um, the original comics by Dave Stevens, who sadly um, is no longer with us, he passed away many years ago, um, they're absolutely brilliant. Um, those three are kind of not as well regarded, to be honest with you, but when you think about it... They've got something in common, haven't they? They're all sort of same, yeah. roughly the sort of same sort of time, yeah. sort of period, but none of them did very well at the, uh, no. at the box office. Which is, a good, which is really, it's really, really strange in the case of The Rocketeer, because The Rocketeer was directed by Joe Johnson. Mm. And he was the guy that directed Captain America The First Avenger. So he, he, so he managed to get that sort yeah. of period mm. piece to sort of and if you, to if work. You, yeah, and, and if you think about Captain, you know, if you think about First Avenger, that, I mean, that was absolutely, you know, box office and that was wonderful and, and what have you. Everybody loves it, everybody likes it. But these three, these, these, those films, including including the Phantom, they really stand up against it as a period piece comic book slash superhero yeah. type of superhero film. They really, really works. Really, really works. It does, but it, it doesn't always lead to box office success because eight, no. eight years later, nobody went to see Sky Captain and the Book World of Tomorrow either. Mm. Um, this particular film, The Phantom, cost $45 million to make. In every single 
percent of that, forty five million dollars, is on camera. You know, because oh, yeah. I mean, the shooting locations are absolutely fantastic. Mm. There's some brilliant music playing throughout. Yeah. Forty five million dollars to make, only made seventeen million back, mm. uh, and only got its got its cost back years later from DVD and video yeah. and Blu-ray sales. Yeah. Yeah. It, it was a huge disappointment for, for Paramount Studios. Um, they were planning on doing more films. Um, Billy Zane had signed up to do two sequels to this, uh, but because of the disappointing sale of tickets for the Phantom in theatres, uh, these just simply weren't made. Um, Billy Zane felt that the studios didn't market the film very well. Well, he's right. They didn't. Because look at the poster. Slam evil. What does that even mean? No. Sorry. <laughs> You could have put Ghost Who Walks and that yeah. would have been just as effective and would have made more sense. Yeah. Um, I like you the DVD of this. Mm. Now, did you watch the trailer as part of the DVD extra? I did watch the trailer, yeah. Do you recognise where the music for the trailer comes from? The music that they used in the trailer for The Phantom was the same music that was used in Judge Dredd. Oh. <laughs> so the tone was completely wrong as well. That's it, they marketed it as if it was like another sort of modern superhero film, and they should have marketed it as like a period piece, yeah. swashbuckling adventure type. The closest we got to any kind of a sequel was a, a miniseries developed by the Sci Fi Channel back in 2009, which actually attempted to bring the Phantom into modern times rather than set in the 1930s. Now, the miniseries ended up getting a number of mixed reviews, so it wasn't exactly a successful series, and it actually upset some of the devoted fans of the comic. Who, Basically because it was pants. Well, yeah, I mean, if it's on the sci-fi channel, that's yeah. normally the kiss of death anyway. Also, the backstory's changed sl slightly, um, because when, when when the boy, when the, 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 the young lad who will become the first Phantom, when he, when he is shipwrecked after the pirate attack and what have him, um, he, he actually swears vengeance on the skull of his dead father. Yeah. Yeah, and you know we don't we don't see that we don't, we don't, we don't this see little lad holding holding his dog. <laughs> you know this 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 you know God knows what happened to the rest of his body. Um, but there he is, just I, I swear on the I swear on the skull of my my, my father that I will. Yeah. There's no mention. I receive whatever. There's no mention of where the ring comes from. In fact, in the comics, yeah. the Phantom actually has two rings. Yes. Both one different. ring, one ring with cross sabers on, yes. which he uses to sort of mark his allies, and one ring which is the skull ring. And if you get marked by the skull ring then you know, right, I'm staying away from you, you're dead. Yeah. Well, at one point you do see Quill with like a skull mark on his face yeah. where from his encounter with the yeah. previous Phantom, but that's the only time that ever gets referred to. Also, the, the rings of the Phantom were made from the same nails that nailed Jesus Christ to the cross. Mm. So it's like, well, there's no mention. No, no of, mention of that. It's like, well, where did these rings of power come from? Mm. There's, there's, there's absolutely none of and that. And that's what I, I know that the, the, they put the kind of the mystical side of things to be honest with but that's not in the comics at all. No. I mean, there's there's no mystical supernatural powers to, to the Phantom's rings. They are merely rings, and that's it. Yeah. So. Um, it does also, I mean, in sort of adding to like bits and pieces being chopped out here and there, the characters feel paper thin. Um, mm. Billy Zane's character, the Phantom, doesn't really have a right lot to do, and although he's got the natural charisma to pull off the character, there's not enough meat on the no. bones in the script. He's he basically is, just a guy in a purple suit. It is very, very much, here are the good guys, Yeah. here are the bad guys. The good guys are good, the bad guys are bad. Apart from Catherine Zeta-Jones' character, who is going to become good later on, but we'll, but we'll under, under, under rather flimsy circumstances. Yeah, she is, is very underwritten. I mean, when we say that she literally turns from a bad guy to a good guy... It is literally like... We, we, we're not that. exaggerating. She's she's very one-dimensional. She seems to be mostly interested in getting into the Phantom's pants. Um, and then when she decides to help out Phantom and Diana, and basically, to use another wrestling term, you turns babyface, mm. it literally comes out of nowhere. Won't really be the case with Kirsty Swanson, though. She makes an enjoyable sidekick slash love interest, but there's not enough time devoted to making Diana and Kit seem like they're even remotely attracted to each other. Or remotely equal. Uh, yeah. She, she, she's very, very much... I know, she's very, very much... Her, the reason why her character exists is to get into trouble and to be saved by the Phantom. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, the, apparently the art, the word... This was the 90s, by the, the way. This was the 90s. There were apparently more scenes filmed to develop the romance between Kit and Diana, but these ended up being cut in order to make the film more 
fast paced. So yeah. when when it, and took, it does rattle along a really really nice pace to be honest. It, it does. It's, it's over before you know it. It was like yeah. it, you know it's like an hour and a half, but it seems a hell of a lot quicker. Let's go on to the baddies. I mean, Trent Williams, James Rema, they play a couple of wonderfully over the top villains that fit in well with the film's tone. I think Trent Williams just goes so over the top sometimes. He's actually, he's actually, it gets to the point where it's like, right, I, sh I should be cringing at this guy. <laughs> yeah. He goes so over the top, it's like, no, actually, I'm, I'm, actually, I'm, I'm along for the ride with this. And, um, Kerry Hiroyuki Takawai, I mean, he's just wonderful in everything yeah. that he's in. I mean, recently, he's been in Man in the High Castle. At this point in his career, he's already a well-established name. Like, if you need an oriental bad guy, yeah. this is who you get. He was in um, Big Trouble in Little China. He was in um, this film, Mortal Kombat, White Tiger, Showdown in Little Tokyo, Tekken, etc., etc. And to be honest, you really want him to be in the film for longer. Yeah. When he comes out and he's like, he seems more like he should be the main bad guy of this film rather than Treat Williams. Um, yeah. Not just because of Takawa's performance, but because the same brotherhood have got more history with the Phantom than someone who's essentially just a corrupt businessman. Um, that and the fight scene that he has with the Phantom as well is, is Oh, that's is really good. good. That's really, really good. And just to show how much of an old timey <clears throat> villain he is, not only does he have a secret underground lair, but he's got fucking sharks as well. Yes! Yeah. Doctor Evil would be proud. <laughs> um, yeah, we, we mentioned this in the Remo Williams episode, you know, superheroes are all the rage now. Uh, we've seen any, any comic book now becoming a movie. Um, very, 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 like, this week, in fact, we're getting Bloodshot. So why not attempt to do another reboot of The Phantom? Why not indeed? Yeah. Strike while the iron's hot. Yeah. Um, it could lead to some sort of extended universe um, type of thing with, you know, Flash Gordon, Mandrake, Lothar getting their own standalone movies before they inevitably have to come together and basically what we're trying to say here is we want Defenders of the Earth to be a movie. Yeah, yeah. We want, we want them all to team up, yeah. you know, have their own movies, yeah. and then team up for a Defenders of the Earth movie to basically go, right, okay, you know Loki, right, well, here we've got Ming the Merciless. Ming the Merciless. We, all need, we, all, we all need to team up to defeat him. Sure, the audiences would, would get behind that. Absolutely. It's, it's this wonderful, colourful, old-timey silliness, which is something that we've not seen in recent superhero movies. No. There have been no movies in the MCU where wolves and horses can talk to each other. No. And to be honest with you, we need more of that in Hollywood. It's a poor... You know, we are, we are much poorer for that. <laughs> that is what we need. <laughs> well, I stand for the new order of things. Modern and up-to-date. Just the man to carry our cause into the 20th century. Silence! You have no bargaining power with me. Oh, and three, two, one, let's go. Hello there. Right, we're in the pub. We're, we're actually back at a, at a uh, retro games night, which the last, just got the theme the, the last time we, did a rec we were in the pub, we're a retro game tonight. I was very drunk. It was when we did The Warriors, another film that's got James Remar in it. It was actually. Yeah. So uh, we'll make this quick because we've got a lot of old school video games to play on. Let me just do a quick pan round. Ignore him. There we go. You can't ignore your producer. No, no, that's big screen. Whoa, 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 whoa. When, when did we make you the producer? Uh, Photographer as well. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, a lot of behind the scenes stuff. A lot of behind the yeah, scenes whatever, stuff. Mate. So we'll make this quick. The talent we'll... is here. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. <laughs> we've got a lot of beer to drink and we've got a lot of old right. school games to play. Well, one or two. Uh, we'll just say this dead quickly. The yeah. Phantom is a fantastic old school swashbuckling action. Um, that where, is the best way to describe it. Yeah. It's an old school swashbuckling action film. Where, and, if, the, if you want to see the baddie from Titanic be a goodie yeah. and dress up as a big purple condom, then The Phantom is the film for you. <laughs> oh dear me. Right, and in these times of trouble, don't we want a little bit of escapism? We do. We, we do. do, we do. And we get that in bucket loads and much more. Yeah, absolutely superb film, really, really enjoy it. Uh, yes, it does have flaws, most films do. This is a genuine, genuine little gem of a film. Uh, 90 minutes and out. Um, 
genuinely you will in, you know you, you will enjoy it uh, can't recommend it highly enough give it a go at least give yeah, it a go you absolutely. know don't just dismiss it as being a, a silly superhero movie from the 90s yeah but they are simply speaking most superhero films are silly superhero movies yeah. regardless of whether or not it's the 90s 80s whatever I have no idea what is going on here right now what is going on right here now He's headbanging, David. I don't know, but my lad's he's doing it as well. He's, he's, they're both headbanging. What is going on? It is a headbanging song. The Prodigy. Oh, okay. Come on, even you have to let us off of that one. Shut up. Well, I'm just worried this might get picked up by YouTube and we might get a copyright claim on it. it, 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 it it's not long enough. Yeah, it's the omen. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, okay. Yeah, Thank I, compl you. I completely agree with you. <laughs> I completely agree with you. Right, um... So, yeah, but, I mean, there are some dreadful, dreadful superhero films in the 90s. Yes. Judge Dredd, The Crow City of Angels, yes. Spawn, Batman and Motherfucking Robin. But, as far as... <laughs> is that his actual name now? That, that's what, that's why... Is that his actual name now? Yes. Motherfucking Robin? I've actually gone and got a sharp pen and gone into HMV and... <laughs> yeah, you just made it. Scribbled all of it. But as far as 90s superhero movies goes, The Phantom is well worth a go. Pop it on the same shelf along with The Crow and The Mask. Give it a go and you may find that you actually enjoy it. Oh dear me. Right, well, we're going to sign off now. We've got a lot of games to play on. We've got a lot of old school... Oh, hey, he's Will. He's Will. We've got a lot of old school retro gaming to be getting on with. Hopefully yeah, this video. Me, it's not on them two. Hopefully this. Sorry, had a moment there, guys. <laughs> Hopefully this video won't get a copyright claim on it. The last time we did a video that had James Remar in it, and we did it in the retro games night afterwards. Fuck yeah, you. we got into trouble. Fuck you, Paramount. Uh, yeah, we... <laughs> this is distributed by Paramount. It is. So we'll have to see what happens. Oh Christ. Anyways, um, <laughs> moving, moving, switching on. Usual gubbies, please. Um, somewhere along here, there will Follow be links. Uh, on the Twitter be, train, there will be at the Big Daddy D and Facebook and followers on the Facebook et cetera, et cetera. Ferrari at the Big Daddy D and uh, Big Daddy D reviews one. We and have followers on the YouTube Uber, I suppose, things, at whatever. the Big Daddy D reviews. Uh, one. We are going to try and we've tried to do this before. It's failed miserably, <laughs> but we are going to try, try and, and do some shorter reviews. Um, you know, 10, 15 minutes and out. Um, Whether that happens or not remains to be seen. Basically, go through our DVD and Blu ray collections, just watch yeah, something yeah, and just tell you about it. You know, just talk to, uh, talk to you about it for 10 or 15 minutes. Um, we're going to try and do that. However, <laughs> considering that the first attempt at doing that is going to be Doctor Who related, yeah. it's probably going to fail. <laughs> It may very well go on for an hour, but we'll see. Um, and if it does, then that is entirely my fault. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but we're going to try and do that. So the next one after this will be one of the shorter reviews. I'm going to call it quick hit. Um, it will end up not being that. Probably I can not. tell you now. Probably not. Um, it will um, and, and it will involve me not writing anything at all because it's all in here. <laughs> um, that's how sad I am. Anyways, until it. then, until then, I am the Big Daddy D. David Mabley. Uh, I am Luke Murphy. How do? And we will see you for the next episode of We Need to Talk About Dot 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 the Dotties. Bye everyone. Wash your hands. Yeah, wash your hands, please. You filthy fuckers. You yeah, dirty bastards. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>